Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's webinar, Protect Your Endpoint Memory, Stop Fileless Attacks, brought to you by Dark Reading and Endgame, and broadcast by UBM. I'm Peter Krauss, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I have a few quick announcements. Uh, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. Also, you can download a copy of the slides, and to do that, simply click on the green folder icon that's located at the bottom of your screen. We will have a question and answer session near the end of the webinar, and you can participate in this Q&A by asking your questions at any time during the webinar. Simply type your question into the Q&A window. That's to the right of the presentation window, and then just click on the Submit button. At the end of the webinar, we'll also ask you to complete a short feedback form. Your feedback is very important, and we hope you'll fill it out. It provides us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. Also, if you'd like, you can launch that survey at any time by clicking on the red Survey button. That's at the bottom of the console. At this time, we recommend that you disable your pop-up blockers if you haven't done so already on your browser. And finally, if you experience any technical problem during this webinar, please type your issue into the Q&A text area, and uh, we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one help. Now let's move on to our presentation. Protect your endpoint memory, stop fileless attacks, and discussing today's topic, we have Braden Preston. He's a principal product manager at Endgame. Uh, at Endgame, Braden is a customer-focused product manager with nine years of experience in developing customer requirements and leading product development. He deals with customer challenges and market requirements and leads, a cross, uh, leads cross functional design teams to bring market, uh, products to market. Uh, in 2012, Braden was the Deputy Commissioner and Technology Workgroup co-lead on the Tech America Cloud Commission for State and Local Government. And the year before that, he held the same role uh, for the Tech America Cloud Commission for the federal government. In 2008, Braden led the development teams on Harris Atari Program, winner of that year's new startup award for Harris Proprietary Businesses. And with all that, I'd like to now turn it over to Braden Preston. Braden, take it away. Great. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate that uh, introduction. And thank you all for attending the, the webinar today. Um, Peter gave a nice background on myself. Uh, currently, I am the, the principal product manager at Endgame. And I've been doing product management in, in the security industry in general for, for the last 10 years and have seen kind of a great evolution in security products, if you will, as well as the process and approaches that our enterprises take to security. Um, you know, we've gone, I think, from a security posture of kind of being compliance focused and compliance driven, what do I need to do to check the box and my compliance, to being really focused on how do I stop this next generation of attacks, these attacks that um, attackers are using to get in, sit deep within my network, move laterally, and then finally exfil data or cause others some form of damage and loss. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about how Endgames helps you solve that problem, specifically around our fileless attack and in-memory protection capability within our platform, and how our security product helps you protect those in-memory blind spots um, better than current endpoint defenses can do. I'll start this webinar by going through kind of a description of, of the problem and fileless attacks in general and talk about why it's so hard to find these attacks with current approaches and current solutions and then kind of get a little bit deeper describing an anatomy of that fileless attack and what it actually does and then finally shift live and run a live demo for you um, in order to show you how we stop those attacks in real time and give you some deeper insights into into the product. As Peter mentioned, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them into the Q&A area there. And if we don't have time to answer your question today, somebody from Endgame, either myself or somebody else on our, our product staff will get back to you. And if you'd like to schedule a demo or something a little bit deeper, please uh, feel free to reach out to us in order to do that as well. 
All right, so with that, I will go ahead and move on with the webinar. And let's first talk a little bit about kind of the, the CISOs or security executives little dilemma I think that he has. And uh, a colleague of ours put this pretty well recently. When the CISO or other security executive needs to report up in a CISO reporting to the board, really he needs to be able to paint a picture of and answer the question, hey, we're good, right? Um, and he needs to be able to say this both with confidence and reliably to the board or whoever they're reporting to so they actually mean it. And the way that they demonstrate that they mean it and where they are is by measuring themselves against some sort of a metric. So the real question is, um, how good are these metrics? How do we measure them? And are they actually meaningful? So the security team or the CISO can both reliably and credibly paint a picture to the board that they are meeting or exceeding their goals um, and that their existing security investments are paying off, that they're checking the boxes appropriately on their compliance posture and they're not absorbing too much risk within their overall security posture. So some of those metrics are listed here. Um, some of the things after talking to a number of security executives, CISOs included, that they're measured against and they end up reporting up. Um, you know, some of those include what are my time to detect metrics? How fast can I detect an incident, and once I do detect an incident, how long does it take me to understand the extent of that breach and respond and remediate appropriately? Um, some other metrics that are, that are tracked, you know, what am I missing? Uh, basically, a measure of risk, how, how much risk exposure do we have from a security perspective? What's my compliance posture? So how do I look from a compliance standpoint? And then a, an interesting metric is, you know, how does this compare to to peers across the industry, whether it's in within your industry vertical, organization size, organization level of maturity, what is that comparison to, to my peers and am I good or bad related to that? And so that's something that's really important that is actually a good measure of where you stand from a security posture. Um, and I think we really all need to be honest with each other and really say that all of these metrics wrap into that final bullet there. What is the overall business impact um, that these metrics kind of report against. You know, if I do have a breach, or did I have a breach, what was the overall impact to my business? Whether that includes um, revenue loss, damage, downtime, reputation impact, all of these things we need to consider when we talk about the overall business impact. And your security program, um, your security posture, needs to be able to minimize and limit the impact that any security incident will have on the overall business. And we would be a bit foolish to say that um, you are not going to see attacks against your enterprise. What our goal needs to be um, from, a, from a security product standpoint and also a security program standpoint is how do we limit that business impact? How do we squeeze the time to detect, the time to respond or remediate before any damage and loss can occur within an environment? So let me take a, kind of a quick look as uh, to what I mean, but before that, we're gonna jump to a, a poll question. Um, kind of ask you what kind of measurements or metrics that you're measured by. I'll turn it over to Peter for that. Thanks, Braden. Yes, everyone, we're gonna do a quick poll. Actually, we're gonna have two quick polls, but this is our first one, and we were just talking about uh, metrics. So we'd like to see what kind of metrics you or your managers are measured by. So uh, please select one of the answers here and then click that little submit button. The question is, what are the metrics that you or your management are measured by? Is it A, time to detect and contain, B, the number of incidents, C, the percentage of incidents that you are able to resolve, D, something else, other, or E, all of the above? So please click on one of those answers, then click the Submit button, and um, let's take a look and see where we've got what kind of answers. Here we go. A uh, big majority, 60, over 60% say E, all of the above. Um, then we have sort of a three-way tie between uh, time to detect and contain, number of incidents, and uh, other. And percentage of incidents resolved, only about 4%, so that's how you're measured. Uh, Braden, any thoughts on that? All of the above, the clear winner? Yeah, and it's not, not all that surprising. I think that they're all important metrics when you're considering um, how you're measuring the overall security posture or where you sit from a security perspective. Um, 
I would, for those of you who selected other, I would love a follow-up if you're interested to talk about um, what those other things are, whether you want to type that in, in chat or the Q&A, or my email was listed in the initial slide, uh, B is in Bravo, Preston at endgame.com. Um, please feel free to reach out to me directly um, if you'd like to, to share some of your thoughts on what other metrics you use to track your security program. Always interesting in gathering that data, so I appreciate that if you're, if you're willing. So we'll go ahead and um, talk a little bit about those metrics in kind of a, a cost view. So one thing we found in talking with, with CISO security executives, SOC managers, et cetera, is that all of those metrics that were listed on the previous slide impact overall business impact. And what's, what's interesting is that it's almost exponentially proportional to the, the business impact is almost exponentially um, proportional to those time to detect, time to contain, time to remediate sort of metrics. And what I mean by that is that the longer that you allow a threat or an adversary to stick in your network, the more pain he can inflict on your organization. So if your prevention tools allow an initial breach, and not allow meaning like, hey, go ahead, guy, or they're just not detecting the right things, um, you're going to start this dwell time metric that I'm sure a lot of you have heard a ton about um, the security industry. There's always, you know, the Mandiant's report every year that comes out that talks about the um, dwell time of an adversary. I think most recently it was somewhere around 146 days, something like that. But once that dwell time starts, the impact to these breaches tend to, to grow within your organization. Um, so this prevention thing as it starts to, to fail on you is, is a problem. And then the time it takes to detect these ongoing attacks, again, as it takes you longer and longer to detect these things, overall impact the spread of the, the infection, if you will, grows. And then it will take you longer and longer to identify, contain, and remediate that threat. So your, your response then begins to be too late. Um, and then finally, you know, if you need to bring in some sort of third party, whether you have an IR team on retainer or you uh, bring them in after you've noticed a breach to, to do a big forensic analysis and forensic cleanup, your costs really begin to shoot through the roof. And so when you look at all this, we can talk about the adversary or the threat being this, you know, nation state actor or, or ran piece of ransomware um, or a lone wolf hacker who's interested or some hacktivist, something like that. Um, as being the, you know, the target for these detection and prevention tools. Um, one thing that I think is an interesting thing to consider is the time is the real adversary here. How can we squeeze time out of your SOC to ensure that they're able to churn through incidents faster, report the right amount of data to the next level of ex escalation, and in turn contain and remediate these threats faster than they, than they were before. Um, so at Endgame, what we really try to do with our tool, with our product, is to squeeze soft time. And therefore, eliminating or nearly eliminating the majority of business impact to security incidents, uh, that security incidents will cause within an overall enterprise. And we do that by taking a layered approach to um, our preventions, detections, and then finally, our responses. So if you think about an overall attack and an attack life cycle, if you will, not the cyber kill chain, but thinking of more from a broad, a broad attack, you can kind of think of there's an initial compromise, a stage where the attacker is going to entrench himself in the environment, where, where he's going to kind of dig deep, maybe gain persistence, maybe inject himself and evade, <laughs> evade defenses and hide in memory, uh, move laterally around the network, and then finally act on his objective. So this is that last stage of the kill chain, you know, whether that's take command and control, communicate out, uh, collection of data, finally exfiltration of data, or um, inflict some level of damage, whether that's reputational or, you know, operational downtime. So at Endgame, we kind of take a holistic view of that attack life cycle and ensure that we can prevent all new attacks at the earliest stage of that life cycle, and we do that through exploit prevention, through malware prevention, through malwareless and fileless attacks, which I'm going to talk about specifically in this, in the rest of this presentation and in the, the demo. Um, and for all ongoing attacks, we need to be able to detect and respond in enough time before damage and loss can occur. So preventing or detecting that escalation, 
the evasion of defenses by going, you know, strictly fileless or hijacking persistence locations, um, being able to stop credential access through cred credential dumping or any other kind of privilege escalation technique, and then finding malicious persistence within the environment. And then for this new generation of attacks, we have within the same product, the same endpoint agent, uh, the same platform, the ability to do deep proactive hunting in the environment. And we enable white, lock, white box analytics for our analysts to kind of elevate that tier one, tier two analyst into a tier three or proactive hunter, allowing them to triage better, again, squeezing time out of the SOC to prevent damage and loss as we go forward. So that's kind of our product as a gen in general, and you'll see some of that capability in um, the demo today. But what I really specifically want to focus the rest of this, you know, the, the next 30 minutes or so, 40 minutes of this presentation is on fileless attacks. And so I'll go through and give you kind of a, a description of what a fileless attack is, if it's not something that you're familiar with. But I think if you're in this webinar, you probably um, are familiar with it. Um, talk about why they're difficult, why it's hard to identify fileless attacks in, in the current state of um, our security industry. And then talk about what we do um, in order to stop those attacks. And then finally, you know, I think the proof is in the pudding in, in any security product. I want to show you that um, what we do is actually unique and novel and can stop uh, fileless attacks before they're able to inflict any kind of damage and loss. So first, let's talk about uh, what a fileless attack is. And at kind of the highest level, a fileless attack is an attack that uses advanced techniques that avoid writing or leaving any artifact on disk. And I think that's a kind of an important nuance. Um, there are hybrid type fileless attacks that may initially load a dropper or something like that, then immediately delete that dropper before it leverages an existing tool like a PowerShell to inject malicious code into memory. But the, the point there is they don't leave any noticeable artifact on disk where they start completely fileless or have an initial fileless uh, file imprint that they immediately delete to, in order to leave no trace. Um, and then typically in fileless attacks, a malicious payload is injected directly into memory of a running process and then um, executes that malware, if you will, directly out of RAM. I mentioned the hybrid approach, so they, in that case they may use a file to, to start. But the primary purpose of a fileless attack is to evade detection while carrying out its action on objectives. Their primary goal, and attackers have, been, have become extremely good at this, is to leverage native operating system functionality in order to get their, their malicious code running inside of memory, where it becomes very, very difficult to detect and even more difficult to take action and respond to. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the beginning. And you know, the metric here from a recent Forrester report kind of proves that point that attackers are getting very good at this, that over half of breaches now don't use any sort of traditional malware. And with that, I'll kind of turn it over to another poll question here, um, and Peter can take the lead on that. Thanks, Braden. <clears throat> yeah, this is our second poll that I mentioned to everyone. So please, uh, we just want to sort of take your pulse on fileless attacks. Have you, at your organization, ever experienced a fileless attack, at least one that you're aware of? And the choices are quite simple. A, yes. <clears throat> B, no. C, you're not sure. You don't know. So again, have you experienced a fileless attack in your environment? Yes, no, don't know. Uh, select one of those answers and then um, just click the submit button. Let's take a look at what we've got. Um, okay, just over half say no. 40, about 40% 40 say not sure, don't know. And uh, almost 8% say yes. Okay, it's a good, good sample. And um, with that, I'll hand it back, Brayden. Yeah, thank you, Peter. So um, it's actually, again, just like the previous poll question, not all that surprising that a large percentage, you know, 42.5% there was in the don't know range. Um, I'd be curious on the no's, uh, what you're using to, to prove whether or not you have a fileless attack or not. Um, I think that they're very, very difficult to detect, which is why there's so much in the no and, and don't know despite the fact that you know, over 53% of current attacks don't use malware or are of the fileless variety. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of reports recently about the kind of, to use an over, overused term, the democratization of some of these nation state or advanced attacker techniques where they're becoming readily available to even um, kind of the, 
the in your basement sort of hacker. So um, again, not not surprising that a lot of them were in the I don't know category, and that is because it's very difficult to detect these attacks. And really, you know, why is why is it that why why is that the case? Um, it's because that files attacks because they don't write anything to disk. Um, they're using the memory space of a legitimate file. So if you're not able to do real-time memory forensics or memory analysis, it's really easy for the attacker to hide within um, a legitimate operating file. And I'll show that in the demo where you know, our, our attacker in the demo use case will inject himself into a legitimate, legitimate process. In that case, it'll be a service host on a Windows system. Um, and then that malware can remain kind of resident until it's accessed or it's reactivated. So it doesn't always have to be active. And in the demo that I'll show, the attacker actually waits for the system to become idle before it starts to execute its code. So it, they can do a lot of interesting things once, we're, once they're in memory. Um, and they really are operating system agnostic. Um, so they, they can run both from Linux, Windows, Mac, all of these operating systems are susceptible to um, fileless attacks. And so if we look at, you know, kind of the difficulty to detect these solutions or detect, sorry, how, why solutions have a hard time detecting these types of attacks um, is that many EDR or detection and response solutions today and even prevention tools rely on rules and or watch list type functionality that basically allows you or forces you to have a preconceived notion or idea of what the attacker is going to do, what process he might attack, uh, or what particular piece, if it's a, say they use a dropper and the file is attacked, what that dropper looks like, what's its hash, in order to um, detect and then respond to these types of attacks. And they've, uh, there's a couple of challenges there that I'm sure I'm not going to tell you anything new, in that these can be pretty stale. You need to constantly maintain and curate these rules to keep up with the next generation of fileless attacks. And they're, because you're using rules, or signatures are pretty easily bypassed. The recent Verizon data breach report um, indicated that indicators of compromise, what we will write our rules to, basically, um, only have a shelf life of about 57 seconds, 57 or 58 seconds, which means that your rules don't really last very long. Some, some might stand the test of time, you know, as attackers um, kind of lower level attackers reuse the same thing over and over again, but the more advanced threats, the ones that are really going to do damage to your environment, are going to change more often than we're going to be able to, to adapt our rules to. And then um, the response action will rely on tier three analysts or security engineers to analyze memory, figure out where the actual detection is taking place, and formulate a very strong uh, response action that's going to cover probably the entire enterprise and eventually cause business disruption. Um, so kind of the main takeaway here is that current techniques and tools that are used to identify files attacks or attacks in general can really be easily bypassed. Um, they traditionally lack scale and in probably the worst cases will cause business disruption to your environment. You'll have to take down endpoints, restart processes, et cetera. Um, and, and really not something, if, if you're, especially if you're focused on the overall business impact to your breach, that you're really willing to do in the environment. And let's just take a quick look at you know, what it takes to kind of find that in-memory attack. Uh, the first thing that you're going to have to do is acquire the memory. So if you're looking within across an entire enterprise, um, acquiring the physical memory of a machine is going to require you to freeze that memory, do a memory dump, and then analyze it. So if we look at like my laptop, for example, that I'm doing this presentation on is, is 8 gig of RAM. We multiply that across an, you know, an average size enterprise, 10,000 endpoints or so. You're looking at 80 terabytes of data that you now need to suck back into whatever analysis tool that you have. And basically, that's no way anybody's going to do that. So you already probably have to have a starting point of a system you think is compromised in order to use a technique like this. Um, and it's also risky. You know, stopping memory, doing a memory dump, a lot of things could potentially happen that could cause um, negative impact to your endpoints. And if that is, you know, a critical asset that is doing, uh, let's say, financial transactions, for example, any downtime for that can, you can lose a number of transactions that could really impact the bottom line of, of your business. But let's say you are able to acquire the memory um, to get that. 
Um, the next thing you need to do is actually analyze that memory. And this is going to require tier three plus plus. It's going to have to know how to use a forensics tool like vol volatility, et cetera. Um, and then you're going to have to really know what you're looking for. And this can be very res resource intensive. And even volatility, the, the, the author of the volatility product, basically says it's highly recommended for you to do this one process at a time. And you translate that to this thing doesn't scale. So basically, memory forensics like this at scale in order to identify a fileless attack happening in real time doesn't happen in today's enterprises because the most enterprises don't have the tools to do that. Um, at Endgame, we focus on providing tier one, tier two, tier threes, the tools that they need to identify fileless attacks among the vast majority, or sorry, the, the vast array of other attacks that the, attack, that the SOC team is going to face every day from exploits, malware, and malwareless or fileless attacks. So I think that what you'll see in the demo um, hopefully will resonate with you and how um, you might be able to start thinking about fileless attacks a little bit differently. For those of you that don't know you have any fileless attacks, maybe it's a way that we can come in um, with a pilot program of our product and see if maybe we can identify something in your environment and happy to help you with that as well. So. I'm going to roll into kind of the setup for the demo now, and I see we've got a lot of questions coming in already and really appreciate that and happy to answer them after we get through uh, the demo, which should take us about 20 minutes or so if you're keeping track of time here. So let me, let me talk about what the attack that I'm going to show you is actually going to do. So it's going to be kind of a, a traditional fileless attack that we see in, in real life, and it, this is an actual real attack. It's an actual APT that I'll talk about here in a second. But the first thing that a lot of these attacks will do is have some kind of spam campaign or convince a user to browse to a malicious site that contains some initial hook, either whether they're going to exploit the browser or convince them to download a Word document that enable macros, et cetera, um, to get that initial foothold within the environment. And in the case I'm going to do, the fileless attack actually uses a, a dropper um, to initiate the attack to, to run a PowerShell script to then inject code into memory. Um, to create that malicious, malicious payload, execute in memory, and then finally um, inflict damage in the overall enterprise, so cause damage and loss. And we've talked about a different, different ways that damage and loss can be inflicted in an enterprise. It's not just stealing data. Downtime can be a huge impact on the overall business. Reputation can be a huge impact on overall business, ransomware, et cetera, depending on what the nature of the attack is. Um, and so just a, just a quick brief on what that process injection is, kind of a nice graphic here where the malicious actor, in this case, uh, you know, the bad guy injector, it could be PowerShell is what, what the actual demo is going to show, is going to take a thread of code and inject that into an existing running process, um, into, the, into the memory space of that existing process. So it allocates some level of memory within that process, and then finally, injects that malicious threat in that process. So now he's running inside of an existing process, very, very hard to detect unless you were going to do memory analysis or memory forensics on um, that particular piece of, of memory. But again, you have to know where to look first. So that attack that I just showed you, that's a, that's a real attack. That is known as the, the Net Traveler campaign. And if you're familiar with Net Traveler, great. I kind of give you a high level of description here. Um, it's a Chinese APT mostly focused on cyber espionage, so data collection um, for use for, you can know, imagine the purposes that they would like to gather data from um, different industries. And it's been ongoing for 12 years, gathering data from over 350 organizations. Um, and it's not focused on a particular industry vertical. We've seen this attack against oil and gas, against crit critical infrastructure, against government and government contractors, financial institutions. They're really focused on gathering data so they can make correlations of data across multiple customers um, to kind of get a full, and you call it espionage file, data collection, data analysis sort of picture. And this is not isolated to a single region of the world. We've seen Net Traveler across 40 different countries. And you can, if you Google Net Traveler, you can get all the reports that, that, they've, that they're brought up in. But it's a, been a long operating campaign. Again, like most malware does, changes signatures so they can bypass traditional detection technologies, and then it hides in memory when it actually executes itself. So kind of a long setup to show you uh, where we are um, in this demo. 
And what we'll show you is we'll walk through the initial compromise phase, we'll walk through the entrenchment phase, and then the act or causing damage and loss, and show you that you know, with traditional security tools, you're going to be able to bypass a lot of this stuff so you kind of get complete compromise. But as I'll show you with Endgame, we can stop it at any stage of that attack. So without kind of further ado here, I'm going to go ahead and, and flip to a screen share and run our demo live for you. And hopefully technology is on our side. So I've just flipped to the screen share and pivoted to a browser where you should be able to see our Endgame platform. And I'll give it a second to make sure everybody's browsers refresh and it buffers and everything like that. Great, so hopefully you see it uh, here now. And what you're looking at is um, a page within our product that lists all the endpoints that we are monitoring. And we can monitor Windows endpoints, Linux endpoints. Uh, this particular demo will be on a, on a Windows system. Um, but basically you can cover your entire enterprise uh, with a single product and uh, a single agent. Um, I'm monitoring, in this case, 16 different endpoints. And the endpoint that we're going to care about is this Acme Inc. Daphne. That's where the attack is actually going to take place. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and flip to that endpoint, and hopefully you can still see my screen. And what you're seeing now is the desktop for the endpoint that's actually going to get um, exploited, popped, and the fileless attack is going to run. And you can see I have this Word document on my uh, desktop here that I'm going to go ahead and execute. In a lot of cases there won't be a Word document here, but it's just an easy way for me to kick off the demo. So what NetTraveler is going to do is I double click this Word document and I have the task manager here loaded so you can see processes beginning to be created. So uh, FS GUI DLL.exe and we put a little star 32 next to it just so you can see things get, get created. So it's creating these processes it's going to leverage PowerShell to then inject himself into a service host uh, that it actually creates. Creates a new service host and then loads into it. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'm going to need to pivot off of this screen in order for it to actually execute because the malware itself or the file is attacking the cell itself here actually waits for the system to be idle for about 30 seconds before it injects the code. But I can show you as we start to see alerts coming in, we saw two pieces of malware get detected. So we de detected that initial dropper and that payload start running before it gets executed into, into PowerShell. So in this case, it's one of those hybrid fileless attacks, and we see both those malware alerts come in. And I've got everything in detection-only mode uh, for this particular demo so that I can show you kind of the stages of, of that attack. And we can drill into one of those alerts, and you can see how we classified the endpoints that we saw that malware on, um, what, it's, what it's running, all the hashes of it. And in addition, we provide a complete forensic snapshot of that particular endpoint. So at the time of the attack, you see all running processes, all open network connections, all logged in users, et cetera. Um, so you kind of have that complete forensic snapshot there um, at the time of execution. And I just saw another alert come in. And you see we have this process injection detection alert. So we were able to detect that actual fileless attack getting injected into memory. And I'll kind of show you what that looks like here from our alert view. And you see it is a process injection. It's a high severity alert. because fileless attacks are typically uh, fairly bad for, you, for your environment. And you can see that it came from service host and injected itself into service host. So it's basically it launched this service host um, process and then inject it into itself. It's kind of what, what the attack is doing here. And then if I flip back over to that endpoint, you can see that service host 32.exe is running. So we were able to detect by analyzing the techniques that the attackers use, specifically process injection, um, to say, okay, there was an attack that just happened. And I'll show you how we prevent that here in a minute. But let's say you're on a system, you get deployed onto a system, that already has this fileless attack running, and you don't know it. Maybe he bypassed your detection capability. Maybe he was there before you um, deployed a security product. Now how do I go about finding that attack in progress? And that's where the, the real interesting part comes in from the end game platform on that detection and response side. So as I went through the example before, on these endpoints, we're running 8 gigs of RAM on all these endpoints that I'm monitoring. I would have to freeze memory across all those processes, 
pull back that memory, do the analysis, a process that would typically take, if not a couple of days, a week or so, depending on the size of your environment. That, and that's, that's time lost, time that the attacker is moving around the environment. He's, you know, it's beginning to, to stage himself and then eventually um, exfil data or, or do something that you're not going to like within the environment. So how do I identify those ongoing attacks in real time almost instantly? So I'm going to go ahead and show you that, and we do that through our automated hunt capability. So if you look, saw the slide we had, you know, we, we were able to prevent attacks, which I'll show you, detect attacks, which I just showed you, or uh, hunt proactively for those next generation of threats that are already existing within the environment. And it's really easy within the product in order to do that. Um, so you select the endpoints you want to investigate, you give it uh, a name, I'm going to call this Net Traveler because we're going to go find them. I'm going to add my hunts. In this case, I want to run a process hunt. So I'm going to pull back all the process data, and I want to be able to identify fileless attacks. From the screen, I'll just walk through really quickly all the different hunts that we have. You can look for any unusual installed application, unusual firewall rules. You can launch a full IOC search. Um, lo look for any un unusual loaded drivers across all your endpoints, unusual network connections, unusual persistence locations, locations, registry locations, removal media system config, or any unusual users. Try to identify maybe somebody misusing an admin credentials and logging in multiple boxes across the network. So I'm going to look for fileless attacks, and I'm also going to classify everything using our malware score capability. Um, confirm those hunts, and then launch that investigation. So what this is going out and doing now live is it is an analyzing all of your processes, determining, trying to determine whether or not it's malware uh, by using malware classification, and then doing real-time memory forensics without stopping, without freezing memory, without having to pull it all back to a platform, so not bogging down your, your network bandwidth, um, and then finally completing. So that took less than a minute across these 16 endpoints, and now I have all the data about all the running processes in that environment, and I can look to see if there are any ongoing fileless attacks. And lo and behold, there is. And you see service host highlighted here, clear as day. So service host is identified as a fileless attack, but why do we think it's a fileless attack? You get the exact uh, thing that happened. So we identified this as a memory injection. We're able to, to analyze that memory, give you the total size of the memory, the exact memory section that uh, we analyze to determine whether or not, what permissions it has. So did it have read, write, read, write, execute, et cetera and the thread ID specifically. So what thread was injected into that process in order to um, run this malicious code? And right from here, I can suspend that thread. So just stop that individual thread, that malicious thread that's running within that existing process. So you can take remediation action, response action instantly without killing that process. So imagine this being, this is a window system. So imagine this being LSAS. You kill LSAS, you're going to blue screen the box. Or maybe this is you know, your homegrown financial application that needs to be running in order to do high frequency trading. You can't just kill that process on a box because you're going to lose transaction time, you're going to lose money. But if we can just suspend that thread so it stops the malicious code from executing real time without causing business disruption or any other kind of damage to your environment. It's a really key part of our platform, being able to take that thread level suspension and do that. Um, so we can get that, you can get, you know, we also saw a call stack anomaly on this and then we also saw a DLL injection. So this did a lot of different things, a lot of different techniques in order for us to analyze this in real time. And so this is a way that a tier one analyst can do really quick analysis to determine whether or not there's a problem in the environment. And he has all the data at his fingertips to escalate to tier two or tier three. And as you pass this up to a tier two or tier three, you assign this alert or this investigation to that user within the product or integrate it into whatever ticketing system you have within your enterprise. Um, that more advanced analysts can download the strings to that file so we actually extract the strings directly so you can do deeper forensic analysis, pull back all the strings for that file and deepen your analysis there to determine um, maybe the overall extent of the breach. And I'll talk about that just really quickly here. I know I, I want to make sure we get some time uh, to answer any questions, but I can pull back those strings. You can see we pull back that file, view it.
and I'm going to pull up that file I just downloaded. I got to get to uh, to my browser window in order to even see it. There it is. And hopefully you can still see the file, but you were able to pull back that exact those, those strings, and we we're able to identify the C2 channel that that particular a piece of malware was communicating against. Now you can take that indicator of compromise and say, were any of my other endpoints using our IOC search capability, uh, did any of my other endpoints communicate with that C2? So you can begin to assess the, the full extent of that breach, again, in real time with, you know, elevating the skill sets of your tier one and tier twos to be able to do this. So that's kind of showing you that detection and response and hunting capability. But how do we stop these fileless attacks from even occurring in the first place? Again, that's really easy within our platform. Uh, I've clicked on that endpoint, Daphne. Um, actually, before I do that, let me go back and uh, kill that service host. Let me go back to the investigation here. Take a look at the fileless attacks. Come back to service host. And you can see where the actual malicious code is running. Kill that process. Yes, finish. If I come back, you'll see service host stash 32 has disappeared. So now that process isn't running anymore. Just wanted to get rid of it so I can demonstrate our prevention capability. And as I go ahead and enable our ability to block process injection. So I see process injection prevention here. Um, I'll highlight all the other prevention capabilities that we have while I'm on this screen. So prevent against credential dumping, credential manipulation, exploits, uh, malware, permission theft, process injection, and changes to any registry locations you deem important. I'll go and prevent process injection, confirm that, and then come back to that particular endpoint that I'm logged into and execute that same attack, that same net traveler word document. Go ahead and execute that. You can see it's starting to create its processes that it needs. Going back to the platform, you'll see those same malware alerts come through. And then in about 30 seconds, we'll get that third alert that, was, that previously was a process injection detection alert will be a process injection prevention alert. So what we're doing in this case is we've identified that we want to stop, we, want, we don't want to allow any process, including PowerShell or otherwise, to inject its malicious code inside of that legitimate process. So we're gonna prevent that from happening in this case. And as soon as we see that alert come up, I'll pivot to that just to, to prove that um, we were able to prevent that, that process injection from even occurring, stopping the fileless attack before it had a chance to embed himself uh, deeply into memory. Um, so again, coming back to what we've talked about before, we're able to prevent all new attacks, stop any ongoing attacks, and then hunt for that next generation of attacks that might be in, um, in your environment. It's taken longer than I, than I expected it to on the process injection prevention side, but we did get the two malware alerts. Maybe we're just that good. <laughs> There it is. Number just changed to three. Sorry for the delay there, but you see that we prevented that alert from happening. We prevented that service host injection from occurring within its, itself, both, both PIDs, and we stopped it from, from happening. So that's the demo. Um, hopefully you saw our prevention capability, our detection and response capability, as well as our hunting capability, all in about 20 minutes. And I'm hoping that you're able to start to paint a picture within your environment of how by leveraging a, a single tool that can prevent, detect, respond, and hunt all within one, really squeeze time out of your sock and elevate your analysts um, to kind of be true, true threat hunters and tier one, tier two, tier three analysts. I'll stop sharing my screen and hopefully everything is successful and get back to the presentation for a final couple of wrap up slides on, on my end and then turn it back over to Peter to, to wrap us up.
And so as you can as you can see and as I demonstrated, we were able to prevent that initial compromise. That was the end of the demo when we turned prevention on. Uh, we prevented that malwareless or fileless attack from even taking place. We prevented the uh, entrenchment. We stopped the entrenchment by identifying that fileless attack, trying to evade defenses, and we prevented it from acting on objectives by going in and suspending that thread and killing that process before any damage and loss can occur. And from back to the time axis, kind of squeezing that time, if you look at the dark red bar here, because we were able to stop before any damage and loss, you didn't take on the cost and impact of IR of the IR, and you've transformed your hunt teams to be more proactive, your SOC teams to be more proactive in identifying and remediating these threats, which really improves your posture when you're talking about overall imp business impact of breaches, bringing down that cost and impact to something that's more manageable in your environment. So that's all that I have. Um, I think I do have a thank you slide, so I really appreciate your time. My email is there, bpreston at endgame.com. If you are out in San Francisco for RSA, we're in the South Hall and booth 1739, it's 1739. Please stop by, uh, get a demo. You have my email if you'd like to schedule a demo. We, uh, we have the uh, meeting rooms available if you'd like a private demo to go in deeper within your environment. Please reach out to myself or anybody at Endgame and we'll be able to schedule that for you. And that's all I have. I'll turn it back over to you, Peter. Thanks, Braden. That was great. Uh, we're going to now go on to our question and answer session, everyone. But before we do, uh, would you please fill out the feedback form that has opened on your screen? If your pop-up blocker has prevented the form from launching, you can click the red survey icon that's at the bottom of the screen. And then to complete the survey form, a uh, feedback form rather, please simply press the submit answer button that's at the bottom of the page. And uh, we thank you in advance for filling out this feedback form. Your participation helps us to serve you better in the future. Now let's move on to our Q&A. Uh, just a reminder, you can still uh, submit your question. It's not too late by any means. Just type your question into the text box that's located to the right of the presentation window. Or you can click the Q&A icon that's at the bottom of the screen and uh, type in your question. Click the Submit button. Let us go. We've got some questions here. And it looks like our first question comes from Dathan. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. Uh, what are the uh, challenges with EDR tools focused on watch lists? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, so first, in order to build a watch list, you have already an idea or some indicator of compromise, some signature that you are building this watch list around. So you are basically saying, I've seen this before, whether that's in my environment or I've got a, a piece of threat intelligence that says, this is what um, an attacker does. This is the hash of the process that it's going to execute in order to do something bad. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong with that approach. I think signature-based um, detections and preventions and watch lists, if you will, are an important part of an overall security posture and we'll do a good job of identifying, um, I, I guess the right way to say is kind of the, the lower hanging fruit within your security, just, just in a way that you probably still need an antivirus solution or next gen AV sort of solution to detect that um, initial malware that's already known. A watch list does that same thing. It'll allow you to do it, detect an attack that's already known to the majority of the security industry, where tools that focus solely, solely on watch lists or signatures miss a massive amount of attacks and really those most advanced threats that you really that are really going to cause damage and loss with your environment. So you really need to be thinking about not only signature based solutions or, sign or solutions that can find the known, but also tools that are designed and built from the ground, ground up to find the unknown. So not leveraging signatures, if you will, but more focusing on the techniques that the attacker has to use in order to gain access or gain footholds within an environment, uh, the techniques he has to use to move laterally to entrench himself in the environment, and then techniques he has to use to finally exfil data. Um, watch lists or signatures won't allow you to do that, to do that technique-focused detection and prevention, um, which basically is a, in the way we like to phrase it around here, a future resilient prevention or detection technology that no matter what signature changes, what hash changes, 
what method changes. Um, if you're focused on the techniques, it allows you to future-proof yourself, if you will, to the next generation of attacks, that next level of attacks. And that's what we try to focus on at Endgame, both detecting the known as well as the unknown through attacker technique identification and prevention. Great. Thanks, Braden. How about predicting attacks? Uh, Bala uh, has asked a question. Uh, how can we predict such attacks rather than terminating them after its execution? Yep, I think that's a, that's a really good question. So there's, there is a predictive element to identifying attacks, and it's something that, that we do in our product in a variety of different ways. Um, you can, I showed the process injection prevention capability. We've done a lot of analysis to determine what malicious process injection looks like based on the techniques that the attackers use to inject into memory and how they do that. There is legitimate process injection that takes place. I think Skype is kind of a famous tool that will inject the legitimate program. A lot of people use it for uh, communication. It will inject itself into memory and it's part of its normal execution. So uh, predictive process injection is important by analyzing the techniques that the attacker is going to use to inject, what level of memory access it has, what permissions that that uh, particular process that it's, that it's trying to do the injection has in order to stop it. It's not really predictive, but it's predictive enough to stop it before execution. And then there are other approaches that we take on our exploit side um, that I didn't demo for you today, but we've had other webinars on it around our exploit prevention capability, a hardware-assisted pr approach to preventing exploits where we watch the performance of the chip, the microprocessor, and determine the number of interrupts that are occurring during um, the loading of a process into operating system memory. And then if we see a, a group of interrupts happen in, in succession and very fast, you can be reasonably sure an exploit is occurring and we can stop that from even loading into operating system memory. So that is a really a predictive approach to prevention. You need really low level system access in order to do that, um, but it's a very effective technique for predicting exploits in, in that case. Um, we do that through our, exploit, our patented exploit prevention technology. Great, okay. Uh, here's a question about uh, saving time. Uh, the, the demo made it look pretty fast. So the question is, how much time does Endgame save uh, in detecting and remediating fileless attacks? Yeah, so I, I walked through a little bit of an example, kind of a high-level example um, during the, the slide portion of the presentation. And I, I said it, I didn't have it on the slide, but doing memory analysis across an entire enterprise will take you on order of, of weeks. So let, let's just say for, for time's sake in this, let's use the example, it takes you a week to acquire the memory you need um, and then do the analysis in order to find where a, a piece of corrupted memory might be. Um, then you need to determine whether or not that memory that's corrupted is actually a file that's attack taking place. Maybe that's another couple of days. Um, and then you need to put together your response plan um, and then execute that response. So maybe you're looking at two weeks or so end to end. Depending on the size of the enterprise and the level of business impact that it's going to cause, that might be a month. Um, but let's just use two weeks for, for this example, just to, to be fair. Uh, we did that same thing in 20 minutes, and I was talking through most of it. So if you just look at that, I mean, that's uh, multiple orders of magnitude faster using the end game product. And if you think about um, what a traditional analyst needs to do, let's talk about maybe a tier one or a tier two, they're going to have these incidents that they're receiving throughout the day. They maybe tops have 15 minutes to make a decision on whether to do, uh, to take a response action or to uh, escalate it up higher. So two weeks is just too long. I think we'd all agree with that. Um, by dropping that two weeks down to minutes, we really save time at all levels of a security operations center from tier one uh, through tier three. And if you have a Hunter and IR team, those guys as well. Great, thank you. Uh, here's a question about uh, uh, preventing. What, does Endgame offer any kinds of preventions to stop fileless attacks? Yep. I guess to stop yeah. them before they occur, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it kind of got lost a little bit towards the end of the demo because um, this was really focused on how you detect ongoing fileless attacks. But we do have the ability to prevent them as well. Um, I threw a slide up where I talked about our layered approach to protection. And protection used loosely as prevention capability as well as detection and response capability. Um, we have prevention capabilities for 
all of those phases. So we can prevent the initial exploit from occurring, um, leveraging the techniques I talked about earlier, our, our hardware-assisted approach as well as um, a software-assisted approach with dynamic binary instrumentation. We have the ability to prevent malware, both malware from being created on disk or executing, so we can prevent malware. We can prevent the initial fileless attacks uh, from being, from starting by preventing process injection. That's one technique to get process injection from occurring. In ongoing attacks, if there's an attacker already embedded in your environment, we can stop him from elevating privileges, from stealing credentials, um, and from doing a, a variety of things to evade defensive tools. So we have a, a long list of prevention capabilities that we use as kind of that an initial stopping of the attack, of preventing all those new attacks from occurring. And then the detection and response, which was highlighted in the demo, from first stopping all ongoing attacks. Great, thank you. Uh, here's a question from Rob, who's asking, is an agent required? And also, which operating systems are supported? Yep. By Endgame? So an, an agent um, is required, and that agent can operate both in a persistent manner or in a dissolvable manner, meaning it will go away after a period of time if you have a short-term engagement. So we have both of those modes of operation, and both of those modes of operation are available uh, across probably most enterprise operating environments, Windows operating systems, as well as Linux operating systems. And we have roadmaps to add other operating systems in the second half of 2017 and into the first half of 2018. Okay. Uh, looks like, uh, well, it looks like we've answered most of the questions. It looks like we're just about out of time. So uh, with that, I'm going to go to this slide and tell everybody that uh, you can get some more information on today's webinar by visiting any of the resource links available there on your screen and on the green folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Also, within the next 24 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email this will contain details and a link to today's presentation on demand. And we'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, Protect Your Endpoint Memory, Stop Fileless Attacks, brought to you by Dark Reading and Endgame. This webinar is copyright 2017 by UBM. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Dark Reading and Endgame, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of our guest speaker, Braden Preston, I'm Peter Krass. Thanks for your time, and have a great rest of your day.